Hello and welcome to the University of York Department of Archaeology Perspective Postgraduate Studies Seminar Series. Each episode features some of the fantastic staff we have here in the department. We're putting this series together to give prospective students a sense of who they will be learning from, what kind of research is happening, and to highlight what makes our department a uniquely wonderful place to undertake a master's degree. In this third episode, we are going to hear about some incredible work in experimental archaeology featuring our fabulous Year Center, and you will also hear about cutting-edge research in field archaeology and digital heritage. Enjoy! Hello, I'm Dr. Amy Little. I'm co-director of the MSc and the MA in Material Culture and Experimental Archaeology at York. I also direct the Year Centre. And today I thought I would talk to you about uh, my interest, which is in prehistoric uh, experimental archaeology research and um, the different types of activities that involves at the Year Centre. So what is the Year Centre? What does Year stand for? Well, Year stands for York Experimental Archaeological Research. And it is a centre that I set up in 2016. It's a fantastic space. It's a grove of woodland um, and it's located on campus, which is really uh, fantastic. It makes it a very useful space that we can access very easily and readily. Uh, it's just a very short walk from the Paleo Hub facilities that I'm located in right now and our bioarchaeology labs. And in this picture, you can see Ray Mears, um, who has opened the Air Centre for us officially, but he also has come back and um, done some of his own filming for his own TV shows uh, with us as well. And in the middle, you can see a replica of the Star Car Mesolithic hut that students uh, were able to help have a hand in making, and you can also see one of our teaching facilities as well. So what is experimental archaeology? Well, I thought I would begin by um, saying what it is not, and it is not reenactment. It is not uh, outdoor education, um, things like public presentations and so forth. This is what we would describe as experiential, but it's not experimental. And um, all those, those things are all perfectly valid and fantastic ways to engage the public and help us to understand the past. It is not what experimental archaeology is. So what is our, uh, experimental archaeology? Well, I've drawn on a quote by Skibo, uh, who talks about it being the fabrication of materials behaviours or both, in order to observe one or more processes involved in the production and the use, the discard and deterioration of material culture. And these are themes which really um, have resonance with my own research because I, I'm very much interested in the use uh, and the making of artefacts in the prehistoric past. So if you are interested in finding out more about what ex, um, what experimental archaeology is, a good place to go to is Exarch Journal, which is online and it's accessible. It's readily available and they have a whole range of different journal articles about experimental archaeology, including this one, which just um, discusses what experimental archaeology is, who does it, what is the use of it? So it's a good first port of call if you're interested in finding out more about experimental archaeology as a subdiscipline of archaeology and what does it involve. But effectively, it involves lots of hands-on practice, and um, which is a good thing because it also means that you get to, to really explore uh, material properties and the production and the use of objects through your own investigations. So what I wanted to talk more specifically about today is my own research interests, which is uh, in hunter-gatherer material culture. So by hunter-gatherer, I mean prehistoric hunter-gatherers, and mostly my research focuses on the Mesolithic period, so which is roughly 10,000 to 4,000 um, Cal BC. But sometimes I drift back in time and I also look at 
uh, material from the Paleolithic period. Uh, I'm really interested in the, the, the objects that, that people made and used in their everyday lives um, and trying to understand how they function and uh, what their sort of social significance was. And to do that, I employ experimental archaeology. I am also a useware specialist, which means that I, um, I study using microscopic uh, techniques and methods the surface of objects to better understand um, or to identify wear traces, which will allow me to better understand the past function of objects. And talking about my research allows me to also touch upon my other um, passion, which is the Year Centre and the types of activities that we do there from research and teaching related activities. So those are sort of the main things that I wanted to touch upon uh, in today's talk. So as I've previously mentioned, I'm, I'm really interested in how, uh, in particular, Mesolithic hunter-gatherers sourced made and used different types of material culture. So not just the more obvious things like lithics and uh, bone and antler, which I will discuss in a little um, moment, but also some of the kind of more um, subtle uh, ephemeral products that, uh, such as pigments, which were used in art and, um, well, yeah, art and decoration, and decoration and also uh, ancient adhesives and here you can see uh, one of my PhD students Tabea um, actually investigating at the Air Centre how uh, tar might have been produced without the advantage of ceramics without the advantage of um, pottery technologies so these are just some areas that uh, I have a, have a broad interest in, in, in interest in, and I work with colleagues here in the department on questions relating to um, these subjects of art and pigment and um, ancient adhesive production. And another area that I have particular interested in, been particularly interested in for some time, and have. Uh, a PhD student working on at the moment, but also you can see in this picture is um, former master students on the Material Culture and Experimental Archaeology Master's Programme, um, carrying out experimental research into a ceramic cooking technology. So that's thinking about how hunter-gatherers may have cooked different foodstuffs or even was it possible to boil water without ceramic technologies. Of course, this was a period of time where mostly there was no ceramic technology. And um, so thinking about what the alternative uh, container technologies were at this time, and also thinking about what were the advantages over one particular organic container, for example, deer skin container, which you can see here in the picture, versus another, like this uh, pig stomach container. It's rather... Uh, disgusting concept you might you might think to um, cook your meal uh, over a fire using a pig stomach but actually we, we were able to show that it was a very effective uh, method of simmering water. So this research uh, captured the attention of journalists in North America writing for the Atlantic magazine which you might have heard of it's a very big uh, magazine in North America who actually wrote an article which uh, interviewed some of our master's students who had been involved in this research project. So a fantastic opportunity for our students and is now currently one of, uh, again, a form of master's students um, central PhD topic. So ongoing research is happening still on this particular topic. Um, one of the things that uh, I have been asked about previously is what do I see as being a really exciting aspect of experimental archaeology, especially experimental archaeology here at York. And I would have to say that it is the way that we integrate uh, bioarchaeology and biomolecular methods such as DNA and lipid analysis and proteomics, things like this with experimental archaeology research. And I think it's a really um, exciting synergy that we have in the department where we have uh, we work alongside scientists, um, such as you can see here, Professor Oliver Craig from BioArc and, and team members 
who were using the Yale Center to carry out a whole range of cooking experiments, trying to replicate the type of food crusts that for, we see forming in prehistoric pottery, which of course scientists then go away and uh, carry out these more um, uh, sort of traditional scientific techniques uh, in the laboratory in a bio arc um, to try and understand the properties of those foodstuffs. But here we have um, them actually using the year center and integrating an experimental approach with their with their research. So this is I would see as a really kind of interesting aspect of the type of uh, research and um, potential teaching uh, activities that we do at the year center. One of my other areas of interest, um, and you can see me here looking particularly happy with myself, is uh, antler or osseous technologies. And I've just uh, got a few broken pieces of antler there that you can see from some of my master's students projects, uh, former master's students who have been working on osseous technologies. But what I am holding in this picture is actually a rare deer headdress, a uh, very rare um, type of artifact which is found uh, in very few places, um, star car being the primary one, where we have uh, evidence for these headdresses and we think that they were, as the name suggests, probably worn on people's heads. Now these artifacts are so famous that actually when I was a student, an undergraduate student in New Zealand, I studied, I learned about these artifacts. So having the opportunity to work on them and to study them in detail when I um, came to the University of York was a really fantastic thing. So uh, here you can see a picture of them. I mean, they're so famous, they've actually been um, illustrated on a stamp. And you can see a really lovely reconstruction drawing there of the wetlands around um, Star Car as well. A fantastic sight. And within this project, um, my primary interest in the headdress was trying to understand how they were made. What was the manufacturing process? How did they, how did hunter gatherers go from killing a deer to transforming uh, the skull of the deer into something wearable? potentially on somebody's head. What were the stages? What were the types of techniques that they used to produce this particular artifact? And um, we carried out experiments, as you might imagine, uh, at the Air Centre, working with Dutch experts such as Deirdre Pomstra, who you can see uh, uh, fashionably wearing the replica that we produced at the Air Centre on his head. And uh, we also have worked with my colleagues here at Paleo Hub, who are anatomists, and they are really good at digital imaging, which is another um, strength of ours at York. And we were able to digitally scan the archaeological objects, which was a really uh, important thing because these objects are extremely fragile. And of course, because of their rarity, you don't want to damage them. So this enabled us to properly investigate the different types of manufacturing techniques without having to handle the object time and again. So it again, it's this sort of integration, I would see, of different sub-disciplines of archaeology. Uh, previously, I mentioned bioarchaeology, but here you can see experimental archaeology being integrated with digital archaeology. And I think that this, again, is a really exciting um, sort of future direction that uh, that I would see experimental archaeology going towards, but also with that, that in particular, that York has great expertise in, uh, in merging these two sub-disciplines. So I have also, I just wanted to discuss um, another aspect of osseous technology that I have been working on recently. And this is part of the Animals Make Identities project. This is a big ERC project in Finland, uh, funded, uh, the PI is Christina Manamar. And I've been working with um, Christina, but also a Latvian uh, researcher called Aya Makane, and she's been carrying out really exciting research, trying to understand, uh, again, the technology, but also how these uh, teeth pendants that we find 
um, quite commonly actually in Mesolithic burials, how they were made, what different types of manufacturing techniques were used to produce these these decorative objects. And I've got an illustration there on the left showing how um, they might have been worn as a necklace um, and as part of a skull cap. And uh, one of the things that we have been particularly interested in is this early stage of the whole manufacturer manufacturing process. So thinking about how did they even extract these teeth from the mandible of the animals? And that might seem like a very simple question, but actually when we started to explore this, and you can see me in the field in Latvia there in winter time with sub-zero temperatures in the snow, working on different types of um, animal skulls, when we started to explore this, we realized that it was a much more complicated question than we had first imagined. And actually understanding this process was really important, not just for um, a few Mesolithic teeth pendants, but actually teeth pendants throughout time, in fact. So uh, certainly from the Paleolithic into the Mesolithic, where people um, have stone tool technologies and again don't have the benefit perhaps of metal working tools. So these were some of the questions we've been addressing recently and are in the process of writing up for publication. My other um, primary area of interest is in uh, grave goods. So thinking about how, um, what, what was the significance of objects placed in graves but trying to address that question from the from the ground up. So looking at empirical evidence for past wear traces were, for example, grave goods used before they were placed in the grave? Um, and if so, how? Have they been used for a long time, a short time? Do they have damage? Were they repaired? These sorts of questions, which might tell us a little bit more, help us understand a little bit more um, about the, the diverse meanings that grave goods held to those who deposited them. And here you can see a project that I was involved in on uh, earliest, at the earliest known burial in Ireland, which happens to be a cremation burial, um, and involved the analysis of this beautiful, completely polished shale ads, which had a really interesting um, narrative, a really interesting biography, which we were able to reconstruct uh, using a whole range of methods, but experimental archaeology was definitely one of them. And it was actually this, this study of the hermitage ads that made me think more generally about uh, the lithic artifacts placed in burials and what they signified. These might are uh, the, the, the sort of the assumption is that these are utilitarian items, but if that is the case, if they're seen as relatively mundane functional objects, why were people placing them with their dead? Why were they putting them in, into these very kind of sacred contexts? And so to explore this uh, question further, I've been studying um, grave goods from a whole range of Mesolithic burials, but most specifically um, burials from Latvia, from a famous site called Zvenjeki, which is the largest, probably the largest uh, Mesolithic cemetery in all of Europe. And here you can see with some of the team members in Latvia carrying out analysis in the museum in Riga, uh, there's the different types of techniques that we've been using, which is microware analysis, the use where that I mentioned, studying the surface of the flint tools to better understand um, those questions relating to use or, or if they've been used at all. And also then replicating the types of wear traces that we see using experimental methods. And we've been carrying out this research at the Year Centre. So this was just a bit of a, a whirlwind tour of my research interests. Um, I hope you found it interesting. There's much more I could talk about, obviously, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot or a taster of my primary interest in hunter-gatherer uh, experimental archaeological research, but also thinking um, 
about how this relates to the to yes enter activities it, we we of course don't just teach prehistoric experimental archaeology we in the picture you can see um some of our master's students carrying out experiments relating to the, the stamps that we find on Anglo-Saxon pottery, for example. We have uh, different types of activities related to Viking age and you name it. So although my uh, talk today has been about the prehistory, pre this is not um, our, our the only uh, area of, of experimental archaeology uh, research that happens at York and it's certainly not the only thing that we teach. But if you are interested in finding out more about studying experimental archaeology with us at York, and I, I really hope you will, then please do get in touch. I would be happy to hear from you and discuss, um, discuss in more detail the types of, um, types of classes and types of activities you might expect to do. Thank you. Hello. My name is Dr. James Taylor. I'm a lecturer in digital methods and field archaeology here in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York. And I'm also director of studies uh, for their MA program in field archaeology here too. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, research trajectory and my current research interests. Um, my background as an archaeologist is in the commercial sector. I have about 20 years experience as a field archaeologist. Um, and the first half of that was effectively uh, in the UK commercial sector. Um, and I later went on to uh, supervise and, uh, uh, and field direct uh, a number of, sort of larger research projects, uh, mainly in Egypt and in Turkey, uh, and in particular, a, a, a very well known site called Chapel Huyik in, in central Turkey, in Anatolia, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. But in the meantime, um, during that time, I also spent quite a lot of time developing uh, and implementing a number of uh, field schools, um, which were designed as capacity building projects uh, in Egypt to sort of upskill and work with Egyptian archaeologists um, and develop their um, field expertise as well. So I've got quite a strong background in field work and field methodology, and that's uh, essentially how, how I've come to, 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 to be where I am, I suppose, today. Um, the Chattel Hick research project is 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 the project i'd like to focus on because in some ways it it, it sparks um or, or my work there sparked a lot of my um current research interests and um um activities as well it's a very very well known uh neolithic site uh in um uh in central turkey uh, it was occupied for approximately uh, 2,200 years, from 7,500 BC to 5,700 BC, uh, and it and it's big. It covers a large area. It's approximately 33 and a half hectares um, uh, in in sort of surface area, and essentially, it's a, it's a human-made mound that's about 20 meters deep in terms of our archaeological deposits and you can see on this on this picture here just a, a small section through that mound where people are excavating um, we had quite a lot of what we call archaeological stratigraphy on this site um, and even though uh, there were projects there run by james mellar in the 1960s and then a 20-year excavation run by Ian hodder um, in, 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 in from about 1993 onwards only about four percent of this mound has been excavated so we've really got just a tiny window into it um, and the project's famous for engaging with um, a whole bunch of uh, not just that neolithic archaeology itself but a whole bunch of different techniques and methodologies including digital methodologies as well which is where my interest in digital recording and field methods come from so the site is comprised of um, a a bunch of buildings essentially that um if you if you were to look at them side on it would look like they stacked on top of each other but what they're not really what they are is essentially um they're built next to each other in neighborhoods and then as um and they're so tightly built together that as they um 
uh, 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 go out of use. They have got nowhere else to, they, they basically have to demolish this building to build the next one on top of it. They've got nowhere to go with it. So these buildings very typically follow the same footprint as you move through the sequence. And this sequence of buildings, this stratigraphic sequence, which you can see we've mapped out and we're now analyzing here in this photograph is, is very, very deep. So if, if I refer back to the slide we were looking at, if you can see the blue highlighted area, um here this is essentially this section here which runs through the whole um or not quite the whole sequence of the site but what's interesting about the sequence at chattel Hook is that at the bottom of the sequence because the site's occupied for such a long time we see uh wild animals like wolves and uh gigantic wild oryx which are big wild bulls um, and at the top of the sequence we start to see domesticates. Um, we start to see um, uh, domestic dogs, domestic cattle, or evidence of domestication, and of course, uh, plants as well. But we also see changes in the technology as we move through that sequence too. So we can see uh, changes in our lithic technology. So that's the chipped stone tools, the obsidian tools that we find on the site. And also we see a change in the cooking technology as we move from uh, uh, um, pot boilers to a, a, a a, a stewing um, uh, pot based cooking economy at the site. So it's a really interesting site. There's loads of really, really interesting data. Um, and as I said, what, what we see are sequences of buildings and spaces, which as you move through the sequence, um, they look very similar and they essentially build up on top of each other. And part of our job as excavators at the site was to unpick this sequence of buildings, record them, excavate them, take them down step by step and, and get information on each of these levels as we move through the site. The site is very well known and it's particularly famous for its artwork, um, not just um, uh, its wall art, um, which is can be quite abstract, like you can see in the top here, or, or this figurative um, wall art, with little pictures of human beings um, actually painted onto the walls of the buildings with pigment but it's also very famous for its um uh, its portable art as well so we get lots of figurines on the site um sometimes they're human uh sometimes they're animal figurines and a range of other interesting artworks so we've got a, a, a clay stamp seal here and a um a, a, a anthropomorphic pot essentially a sculpted pot with a human face on it so yeah it's particularly well known for its artwork but uh, but also um it's worth noting it's not just about the art there's lots of really really interesting material culture that we find on the site so we found ground stone um which is things like pestle and mortar or um or or more um grinding stones for 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 working with um uh, uh cereals we find cutting implements made from obsidian. Um, we also find uh, charred botanical remains, um, worked bone tools, um, and a range of different kinds of, especially beads and different types of ornamentation, um, which um, just sort of give us this amazing insight into the into the structure and, and way of Neolithic, Neolithic life ways, I suppose you could call it. Um, these are distributed with, in situ within the buildings um, in a very kind of almost like um, a very fairly predictable way because of, as I was saying, the, site, the buildings don't tend to move that much because they're hemmed in by other buildings around them. So we will find burials underneath the platforms in the northwest corners of the buildings. We'll find usually a half in the center of the room or in the southern part of the room and ovens uh where cooking will be done um and then um occasionally we would find things like pots embedded into the floors um and storage bins and so on in 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 side rooms uh to one side of the house and so this is a fantastically rich um archaeological picture that we're able to build up um by excavating these sequences um, as I said early on, though, one of the things that we've always tried to engage with um, uh, at, at Chattel Hook is, is the way that we record and understand this archaeological data. And in the course of 
Ian Hodder's time at Chattel Hewick, um, the discipline of archaeology has become increasingly digital. In fact, we've been using computers in archaeology for as long as, uh, as, as, as they've been around, essentially, to try and gather and analyse our data. But recently, with an uptick in things like tablet technologies and various 3D technologies that are emerging that you may be familiar with, we the the, the project from about 2012 or 2013 began to explore digital workflows for recording um, what you would have been done analog. So this is an analog hand-drawn section of the site. And this is basically a 3D model of the same section, which these two uh, gentlemen here are cleaning in the middle of. And also um, at the bottom here, you can see a, a, a large, uh, scale laser scan of the whole south area of Chapel Hick as well. Um, so we began um, to experiment with digital methodologies and the project from about 2012 underwent a very complex transition to paperless recording and started to um, develop a methodology um, which was um, quite critically engaged with these tools I suppose um, to try and transform form not just the way we understand the site using digital technologies but also the way that we're able to interpret the site as well so here this venn diagram is basically trying to say that by uh, archaeologists uh, as as um, agents who are recording the, the archaeology by using the technology and the information that you can bring directly into the field using the internet and um, the wireless um, databases that we were using on the tablets we could sort of really get a deeper understanding at the trowel's edge of what we were doing in the field um, and perhaps even be more efficient and precise in our recording and more able to sort of um, bring that interpretation right into the field using these technologies and we did indeed see different things using these technologies as well so here is an example of a 3d model uh, of a human uh, burial that we excavated on the site um, and uh, it, it, for the first time actually we were able to identify in this uh, retrieval pit for skull um, of a body that that was um, not necessarily perceptible before we started excavating it because we'd done 3d models at every stage during the excavation process we were actually able to see the skull retrieval pit and um, this is a phenomenon that you see in the neolithic in in parts of the middle east where skulls are retrieved and curated um, as part of um, um, the way that people engaged with the dead in in this part of the world um, so what we found was that by using tablets in the field, we were able to bring a whole bunch of information that would normally be off-site, like the database, um, the videography data that we had, various legacy data about the site and archive reports from previous seasons. We were able to bring them into the field um, and be able to refer to them as we were excavating. And as I say, this kind of changed the way that we started to produce knowledge on the site. So this work has really gone on to inform, you know, since the project ended in 2017, it's gone on to inform a lot of the work that I've done uh, or, or, or collaborations that I've had um, linked to digital methods um, in and around the University of York. So um, we've attempted to do a digital recording in, at uh, Elizabeth Castle, where we've experimented um, with um, digitizing and drawing directly into a into a computer, into a geographic information system, um, and augmented that with three D models. Um, and then um, this is linked to work that I've been doing with my colleague here at York, um, Colleen Morgan. Um, um, I, in the aid memoir project where we've actually been investigating the impact of these digital technologies upon our uh, um, upon drawing and upon our ability to to do um, to create knowledge through drawing in archaeology I suppose um, and I'm also linked to a number of other projects like uh, uh, like like the matrix project which is connected um to which is a collaboration with historic england where we are um, exploring the digitization of stratigraphic data um, in archaeology and a new project which i'll talk about a bit in a minute called tetrarchs which is looking at the way we um 
use and reuse data, particularly with um, the idea of using it for storytelling in archaeology as well. And I'll come to that, as I say, shortly. So Aid Memoir, which is the first of these sort of projects to kick off, um, was exploring really how digital recording compares with analog modes of recording, um, uh, with a strong focus on drawing in archaeology. Drawing is a massive part of archaeology um, and it helps us. We found that, or, that it helps us to create mental models of how we understand archaeological material. That's what this rather complicated diagram it, it represents, a, 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 a stylized version of a mental model. We don't need to go into the details of that. Suffice it to say that when you start to stop drawing by hand and begin drawing by uh, um, um, using digital tools, those mental models or the way those mental models are constructed changes as our practice changes as well, basically. Uh, uh, with other colleagues, uh, like my colleague and collaborator, Nicolo De Lunto at the University of Lund, we I've tried to examine and explore why our digital practice so often emulates our analog practice so why do when we start to draw when we start to um uh, use 3d technology for example do we basically use it to create 2d maps which are essentially a skewer morph they're an emulation of what we do in the analog um field and one of the things we've come to the conclusion is that this process of copying, using digital technologies to copy um, analog technologies is very much linked to uh, the idea of getting to grips with those technologies, to socializing ourselves around them and getting familiar with them and testing the boundaries of those technologies so that we know that it can do what we need it to do. And it's only when we've done that that we can start to then um, change the way we do things with digital technologies. So this is something that we've been exploring recently and thinking about. Um, and linked to all of this is this overriding interest that we all have, I think, uh, as digital archaeologists in the way that uh, our digital approaches affect our um, our modes of practice, the way we do archaeology, but also the way that we record and archive archaeology. So, you know, and there's a big trend within the discipline at the moment to think about um, how um, we might structure our data in such a way that it's really easy to reuse. Um, and so I'm quite interested in thinking about how the site gets translated into our uh, both physical archive um, and then how that's related to the digital archives that we produce as well. And this brings me on to the current big project that we, that myself um, and a number of my colleagues here at York are linked to, which is called Tetrarchs, Transforming Data Reuse in Archaeology. This is a big European funded project um, that's linked to six partners across five countries. And in this project, we're really trying to think about new workflows for field and laboratory and archival practice in archaeology, thinking about how do we structure that our data in such a way that it, it, it's useful for cultural heritage storytelling and best practices for optimizing our data so that it can be used by you know, heritage interpreters or educators or other stakeholders to 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 tell stories about the past, essentially. Um, one of the projects that um, will form a case study for that is my current excavation project, which is in Tumba Seron in northern Greece. Um, this is a, a, an excavation at a late Neolithic uh, village site in the um, wetland environment around what would have been a Palia lake called Lake Akinos in, in the Strymon Valley in northern Greece. Um, this is a survey and excavation project um, which seeks to date the site, understand its sort of structure as a, as a, as a sort of socioeconomic uh, entity um, and think through and, and get an insight into who was living there and how they were living there as well. And it also incorporates a, a wider understanding of the landscape and, and sort of uh, the, the area around the site, what we would call the hinterland. Um, and so far we've done a couple of seasons of excavation and lots of geophysics on the site. Um, 
and as part of this and linked to Tetrox as well, we are try we are experimenting with hybrid digital recording methodologies, including drones and 3D models and geographic information systems. We're digitizing all of our data. We have a project ethnographer who's working with a variety of local um, and regional stakeholders in the site to collate oral histories about the site and to try and understand how the site has value in, and significance within those communities as well. And um, we're hoping to um, move forward and build a, a, a digital archive that's accessible to all these different groups of people and involve them in the in the creation of knowledge and curation of data about that site as well. Because we would like to both you know, increase the, the multivocality, the sort of the different voices, if you like, that have a, a, um, a say in, in, in that site and recognize that the, 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 the record that we produce, our understanding of the site might be interpreted differently and there are different um, meanings um, in that as well. And we would like to facilitate a sort of equity of access and control over that archaeological data. And to do that, we're trying to involve people, develop a participatory approach to designing and reusing those technologies. And so that really is where my research is at at the moment and where we hope to take it in the future. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Hi, I'm Dr. Coley Morgan, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my research today. And I've titled my talk, Digital Creativity, which is actually the title of the module that I teach, but I'm going to be talking a little bit more about how digital creativity is enacted within my research and within the University of York Department of Archaeology in general. Right, so um, my areas of research focus include augmented reality and virtual reality in archaeology, um, digital materiality in archives, digital and analog field recording in archaeology, and household archaeology in the Arabian Gulf. And I'll be talking mostly about virtual reality today, but I do touch on the other topics as well. Uh, my primary research project right now is Other Eyes. Other Eyes is a project that I've been dreaming of for many years now. And it is in partnership with the uh, Archaeology Data Service, the um, Beta Jester, who is a small to medium enterprise video gaming company here in Yorkshire, and York Museums Trust. And I have a huge amount of project members. Um, they, uh, some of them were with me at the beginning of the grant, and some came on to the grant um, later on. Importantly to this discussion is that I involved the work of ESBA, which is the European Society of Black and Allied Archaeologists, um, and their insights were really, really important to um, help me along with my research. And so I tried to have a really diverse team of experts help me out thinking about these projects. And Other Eyes is um, a project that you don't have to read all of this text on the screen, but it is inspired by this Proust quote. And so the only true voyage of discovery, the only fountain of eternal youth would be not to visit a strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold the hundred universes that each of them beholds, that each of them is. So what I'm really interested in is making avatars of dead people. So looking through other eyes, looking through the eyes of other people. And arguably, as archaeologists, we've been doing this for a really long time now. We try to imagine the past as others may have lived it or may have experienced it. But more recently, technology has gone a long way towards enabling us to actually do that in a more sustained and interesting kind of way. I argue that we in the past, we think about people in the past as we think about ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but if you maybe broke your arm um, in the past, they didn't have a health service or a hospital necessarily that was able to really treat that. There was a lot of help, but it was probably a very disabled past. If you wear glasses, if you had some other things happen to you, People in the past did not necessarily have the same kind of bodily affordances that we have today. 
But how do we reflect that within digital technology? How would we be able to use digital technology to explore the past through other people's bodies? And this is this research. The research questions, um, as you see, most importantly to me, the very first research question was, um, what are our ethical responsibilities involving visual and embodied representations of people that in incorporate biological data? Many reconstructions of past people have been created over the years, but these reconstructions actually were identifiable individuals in the archeological record. I was very interested in bringing the science of bioarchaeology to bear in trying to represent people, not just kind of a homogenized, oh, this is kind of what the people in the past looked like, but actually saying, was this person injured? Did they, what was their past? What, were, what was their journey through life? And so I was also interested in how immersive technologies can combine fields in archeology, span like digital archeology, span ethnography, bioarchaeology. When you reconstruct past worlds, you need to bring as much data as you possibly can into the question. You need zoo archeology, span you need bioarchaeology, you need landscape archeology span to really fully reconstruct the past as, as much as you possibly can. The third question, it, can reconstructions created through immersive technologies challenge preconceived notions and promote empathy regarding disability and embodiment in the past? So this is really important to me as um, it's not just enough to try to say, oh, this is quite interesting. This person might have climbed a hill a different way, but really to connect with these past people and understand how they may have struggled. But also we do a lot of digital archiving at the University of York. And so I wanted my research to directly impact how we might record archaeological sites, but also how we might archive them as well. Are there kinds of data that we aren't collecting that is really useful to reconstruction? And I partnered with the Yorkshire Museum and it's really fantastic because it's literally attached to the King's Manor where I work. And it's full of really fantastic people who are interested in collaborating. And as you see on the floor here, there is a mosaic there that was excavated near um, Toft Green, which is about this less than a kilometer away. It's really interesting to me to work with all of these sources of data that are within a 10 minute walk of where we are here at the King's Manor. And so the mosaic was, I centered on the mosaic as my augmented reality experience. I wanted to use the uh, mosaic to build a room around it and so that you would have the experience while you're in a VR headset of walking on the mosaic, the same mosaic that some of these people might have walked on in the past. My first avatar that we decided to reconstruct was um, what we think might have been a gladiator. Now this gladiator has had a fantastically interesting life in that we were able through bioarchaeological data to see that they probably came from somewhere in the Middle East, maybe a um, Jordanian Syrian signal that they left as a child and they had a lot of injuries. There was some trauma to the left shoulder. There was some trauma to the left arm. And many of these things have been argued to be indicative of injuries that a gladiator might've suffered. This person was also decapitated, but missing large portions of his face. I wasn't necessarily interested in facial reconstructions. I was interested in how they felt in their body, but the facial reconstructions actually became really important later on to understanding how people identify themselves within other people. And as you see here, this is a um, the skeleton that is in fragments, and this is held by the York Archaeological Trust, who is another near and dear partner of both this project and the department in general. It's fantastic how many partners we use and work with within the city. Um, the second one was the Ivory Bengal lady who is a very storied person here in the UK. She was um, excavated in York and was a very high status burial with jet, elephant, ivory bracelets, um, earrings, pendants, et cetera. She lies in state right now in the Yorkshire Museum. And we, they think that there is she was probably the um, a female 18 to 23 of um, potentially what we consider today as mixed race. So these two avatars are obviously not necessarily what people think about as Romans. And so this was an, another really interesting aspect of this research to explore for me. And then VR and XR archeology, span I have kind of a, a blended um, picture here that you can see. Um, and this is um, the laser scanner, the 360 that we have um, in the department. 
that we use. And I, I laser scanned the space to get a better sense of what um, how to reconstruct the room around it. And you see, you see it's kind of a blend there of the real space and as of the reconstructed space. That was not a final draft. This was working with the video game company was absolutely fantastic and really fascinating. But it was interesting because I would say, okay, so this is a Roman villa. This is, you know, how people lived. Here are some couches that they might have uh, um, eaten on, things like that. Um, but they made the first version very old looking. And so this is to me is um, quite interesting because I don't think that the Romans would have lived in the room when it looked like this, but it is kind of um, what video gaming companies think of as old and archaeology. And so the final draft looked a little bit more like this. And this is actually a screenshot of the in um, the experience as you are. Um, it's not a great screenshot, to be honest. Um, it's on a sort of low res, but we're still working on that. And the experiment is to put people in this VR headset and have them walk around in these past people's bodies to see if it changes their ideas about the space and place and time. And it's been pretty successful. People have been really interested in it as part of the mixed reality. I have people wear the actual um, the clothing that they, some of the people might have worn. And um, it has been fascinating to see the different reactions to it. And you see a foam cube there that Adam, the curator at the Yorkshire Museum of Roman Artifacts, is sitting on is actually corresponds to one of the couches that you can sit on there. Um, and one of the fantastic outputs of this research was actually a very analog output. This is um, during COVID-19. So we thought, okay, so we're trying to do this virtual reality, this multi-sensorial experience of the past. How would that actually come out in an analog version? And um, it was developed by a student named Ellie Drew, and she was a, a master's student here at York in the digital program at the time. And she developed... Um, a multi-sensory kit for people living with dementia. And um, we we're able to put Roman artifacts in people's hands and talk to them about stories from the past and give different senses. There were some um, senses of lavender and things. And this was during lockdown when there wasn't very much provision for multi-sensorial experiences. And it was just really gratifying to be able to grow virtual research in this way to uh, contribute to people's lives. I wanted to briefly speak also about um, another project that I am involved with. It's called the Avebury Papers. And this is something I'm really excited about because it is pretty much just starting. And we are digitizing the entire archive at Avebury. And so we're bringing out all the old letters, the old photographs, the old drawings, and we're trying to breathe new life into them through digitizing them. But we have a lot of partners on it. It's a big volunteer experience as well. And they um, we're going to have artists and we already have students who are basing their dissertations and their work on outputs from this research project. Finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the excavations at Hilly Archaeological Park, which is the um, project in the Arabian Gulf that I'm working on right now. Usually we go over Christmas um, or during December or January, um, but there's a lot of uh, um, outputs and research that uh, students have helped me work on as part of this. This is actually Layla um, Arar, who is a current PhD student um, here in the department. Uh, she's working on how to understand digital archaeology in a commercial context, but she was a master's student here first, and so we've had a fantastic journey together. Um, the Hilly Archaeological Park is um, in the Alan uh, UNESCO World Heritage Area, and it's one aspect of this world heritage. And as you see, it's this very beautiful green park in the middle of Alan in the United Arab Emirates. And the Alan is known as an oasis town. It is inscribed, you know, by UNESCO as an oasis town, and so it's a fantastic place to work. And we're looking at the Bronze Age in the Hilly Park. And let's see, so, um, so we excavated several trenches um, this past year, um, 11 in total, and some of the finds were, you know, fairly ephemeral, but really interesting activity areas. This is a little plaster lined pit that was probably used for some kind of processing or fire. We're doing a lot of the scientific analyses on these things now, and I'm working with other students on the, in, uh, making heritage plans and other digital documentation interpretation for the site. 
And as you see here, this is our team. And um, perhaps most interesting to um, people interested in coming to York is that there are several people in the background there that were um, master students or our current PhD students here at York. And so it's really important to me to make sure that my research goes into my teaching and that students are able to experience these things and these aspects of research that reach out south of York, outside of the UK, and into these other places like the Arabian Gulf. And so that, I think, pretty much um, it finishes it for me. If you want to talk about any aspects of sort of digital creativity, digital archaeology, digital heritage, I'm extremely happy to talk to you about them. And you can find me on um, Twitter and at my website. So please get in touch. And thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Dr. Ashley Lingle. I am a lecturer here in the Department of Archaeology at York, and I am also the PGT or Master's Admissions Lead. So hopefully you really enjoyed the talks that my colleagues gave uh, ahead of this presentation, and I thought what I would do now is just give you a little bit of a flavor of what it's like to undertake PGT or Master's uh, study here at the University of York in our lovely archaeology department. So what's it like? We have a really diverse range of taught degrees, a very dynamic teaching team, which you'll see hopefully from the, the presentations you've just watched, but throughout this seminar series as we uh, highlight some of our incredible staff and the degree programs that they teach on. Uh, you'll see that it's really cutting edge research, but it's also pragmatic. So there's a lot of professional applications. Uh, while you're here, you'll be learning independent study skills and how you can contribute within the field. And uh, I really can't stress enough that we've got a really diverse team that are influential thought leaders and they're really leading the way in what's being done and studied uh, within the scope of cultural heritage. Our teaching approaches uh, are diverse, so we use a broad range of assessments. Uh, we really like to get you out there doing field trips uh, kind of across York, but other parts of the UK as well. Um, and then in the classroom, um, a lot of uh, seminars, discussions, group work, and then a variety of assessments as well. So you get a sense of uh, not just um, kind of formal learning structures, but really how to collaborate. We have a very broad range of courses. Again, um, you'll be able to see these as the, our um, YouTube series develops, uh, but we've got a range of both MA and MSc degrees. So those of you uh, interested in science or less science, um, but across different time periods, material types, etc. And again, a number of heritage degrees. So uh, not just archeology, span but cultural heritage management, conservation, uh, and a new museum studies program coming up. We also share uh, sustainability studies with our Department of Environment and Geography. While you're here, the degree structure, uh, you'll take three 20 credit modules in your first semester, and then again in your second semester. And some will be core, but then you'll also have some option, optional modules depending on which program you're selecting. And from there, you'll do an 80 or 60 credit dissertation depending on whether or not you're uh, involved with some of our placement programs. So uh, here's a very long list of modules in semester one. Again, you'll have some that are core depending on your program, but you'll also have some optionality. And so you can really tailor it to your interests and what you would like your future career to look like. And again, in semester two, a real wide variety of options, including the curated placements where you'll be working with different partners uh, throughout the UK to undertake uh, kind of very practical, practically based work. If you're interested and you're not sure how to pay for it, we've got some funding support that you can access as well as um, access to uh, your indig individual directors of study. So if you know what program you want to um, apply to, go online, have a look at who you need to contact and just have a chat with them. Uh, once you're ready to 
submit your application, uh, have your academic transcript, two pieces of written work. These can be essays or um, professional reports, anything like that, just to give us a sense of your writing skills. Um, your CV, if you need a, a language certificate, uh, a personal statement, and then uh, some references. It's all managed through the online portal and it's very uh, intuitive. So uh, again, if you're interested, please have a look at uh, the different degree pages and contact your directors of study. For the program that you just watched, uh, please have a look at these uh, three individuals uh, as they're the lead directors of study for those programs. Thank you very much and we hope to see you here at York Archaeology.